Lee Johnson was 74 years old when he went missing from Newtown, North Dakota. On October 15, 2011, he was supposed to visit his son in Jamestown, but he never arrived. The next morning, he was seen in the Four Bears Casino and Lodge in Newtown on security footage playing poker, and then the footage shows him leaving around 12.35 a.m. The camera then caught him taking a right out of the casino onto Highway 23 towards Newtown. The tip that he was there came from a bank statement that showed a withdrawal from an ATM at the casino. That same day, he was supposed to see his sister in Valley City and then go to an appointment at the VA hospital in Fargo on October 17th. After the appointment, he had plans to go to Needles, California to spend the winter as he often did. However, he never made it to see his sister, he missed his appointment, and he was never heard from again. When his son checked his father's home, he found groceries lying out and his suitcase half-packed. No one knows if he actually made it home and headed for Valley City as planned. Some people believe from the appearance of his home that Ronald might have been interrupted while packing and left suddenly for an unknown reason. However, the most plausible theory is he had already started packing his suitcase and laid out groceries for his trip before he ever went to the casino and he never made it back home to finish packing. His medication and checkbook were left behind, but his 1982 gold Cadillac Fleetwood was missing. Authorities pinged his last known cell phone signal in the area surrounding North Dakota Highway 23 and North Dakota Highway 83. They found he had called the person that usually rents his home from him while he is away in California for the winter. This area was searched by the North Dakota Civil Air Patrol, but no evidence of Ronald or his vehicle were found. With Ronald's car not turning up and his accounts never being used, led to a theory that he might have had an accident. It is believed that he and his vehicle may have gone off the road into a ravine or into the Missouri River after he left the casino that early morning. He would have had to cross the Missouri River when he was headed back to Newtown. His family has organized many searches looking for Ronald and his vehicle, but they have turned up nothing. Ronald has no history of memory issues, but he is a diabetic and also had major heart surgery in the past and needs daily medications. Ronald has never been found, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Barbara Louise Cotton was born November 10, 1965, to Louise Cotton and lived in Williston, North Dakota. Her nickname was Barb, and she is described as a gentle and kind person who had seven siblings. She went to Williston High School and worked part-time jobs to save up money for her future. She was a good student, and when she was a teenager, she decided she wanted to go to college and become an accountant. Sadly, she would never get the chance because she would go missing at the age of 15. This case is not easy because there are many conflicting details available. Barb's case was originally investigated as a runaway case. Investigators did not initially investigate the case as a missing person or possible homicide. At this time, there are three persons of interest. One report says that she was last seen leaving a restaurant named Cakes and Cones on Main Street in her hometown of Williston during the evening of April 11, 1981. She had apparently been there with Stacy Werder and a third person. Stacy was described by Barb's mom, Louise, as being her new boyfriend. He offered to accompany her home afterwards, but she declined. Barb had five blocks to walk to get to her home, located near the corner of 5th Street West and 6th Avenue West. However, Barb was very independent and often walked alone, but it is unknown if she ever made it home after leaving the restaurant. Teenagers from the neighborhood often walked through Recreation Park on their way home. Her boyfriend watched her walk to Recreation Park. The next day, on April 12th, her mother reported her missing. However, none of her personal belongings were missing, including her carton of cigarettes, clothes, or money. She also left behind a paycheck from work. Her younger brother stated he was very close to Barbara, but she never told him of any plans to leave home. 
It is unclear where Barb was actually last seen the night she went missing. Another report says her mother claimed she was reportedly seen at a party at 10 p.m. that night, but that could not be confirmed. The next day, on April 13th, her mom reported to police that she thought that Barb was in Scobie, Montana at Pioneer Hotel with Stacy Werder. This may have been because she assumed she ran off with Stacy, and this is where he was scheduled to go for his next work assignment. Police followed up on this, but noted she was not located at the hotel. According to reports, Stacy became a person of interest, although police may have never interviewed him. Stacy apparently hung himself three months later in Malta, Montana, while being jailed for an unrelated misdemeanor. Another person of interest is Frank De La Pena. Frank was temporarily in Williston for about a month during the time that Barb went missing. He left on May 5th, 1981, 24 days after she disappeared. He drove a white van pulling a travel camper and had attempted to lure many women and children to the van and camper. He would attempt this by approaching them and saying that he had a free puppy he needed to find a home for because he was moving out of state. Many people came close to entering the van or camper, but thankfully they had second thoughts when Frank began asking them to step in and help search for the puppy. Sadly, he was successful just two days after he left Williston for Wyoming and lured a 9 and 12 year old girl inside and killed them. He was arrested and hung himself inside the jail and left behind a suicide note. A third person of interest in Barb's case is her older brother, Frank Cotton. He was 16 years older than Barb and is described as a very strange man. He and Barb's mother were close, although he was at times abusive to her, just as his father had been. Prior to their mother's death in 2014, she was heard multiple times saying she was going to hell for what she had done. However, she would never elaborate on what exactly she had done and would get angered when questioned about it. Many people believe that if Frank had killed Barb for whatever reason, that their mom may have covered for him either out of fear or loyalty. Frank died in 1999 at the age of 50. His headstone is next to Barb's headstone that reads missing. Barb was legally declared dead in 1998 and her mother passed away in 2014, maybe without ever knowing what happened to her daughter. Thanks to the hard work of the podcast Dakota Spotlight, many new details are coming out that was not well known before. Due to lack of investigation by police, when this originally happened, a lot of people that could hold significant information have been missed and never interviewed. Thankfully, some of these people are coming forward today and cooperating with the podcast to provide missing details. Barb has never been found, and as of today, this case remains open and unsolved. Kevin Gerald Mahoney was born June 23, 1968, and lived in Fargo, North Dakota, and had six siblings. When he was 25 years old, he lived with his mother, Judy, but spent most of his time at his friend Ben's house, which was also known as the Party House. In September of 1993, Ben had recently divorced and was renovating his home at 1118 11th Street North in Fargo with Kevin's help so he could sell it. Kevin's mom last saw him when he left home on September 30th, 1993 to go to Ben's. Ben and Kevin often worked on the house during the day and they would start drinking at night. On October 2nd, his family became concerned when they had not seen or heard from him in a few days, which was very unlike him. When his family began searching for him, they would question Ben, who told them that Kevin had left his home to walk to his brother's apartment three miles away in Moorhead. However, no one ever saw him walk in that evening. That same day, with no word from Kevin, his sister would file a missing persons report. A few days later, police went to Ben's home and talked to him. He told the police that he had not seen Kevin since September 30th, but did say that him and Kevin had gotten into an argument while working on the home. He said that Kevin called several of his family members looking for a ride, and then he assumed Kevin took off walking to his brother's apartment. Kevin's friend Lene said he did call her and ask for a ride, but she was unable to because she had to be at work. 
A few weeks later, after Kevin disappeared, Lene went to Ben's house to check it out. The door was unlocked and she let herself in. While looking around, she found a pair of jeans that had blood on it, which she took to the police and they determined it was human blood. Police would get a DNA sample from Kevin's mother and grandfather, but it is unclear if they ever tested it against the blood found on the pants. A few weeks later after he disappeared, the police returned to Ben's house. However, this time Ben told police that Kevin was very drunk when he left the house and he didn't see which direction he went. Ben took a polygraph test two months after Kevin disappeared and passed. However, on a third interview, his story changed. He said the last time he saw Kevin was October 1st and they were both drunk. He said on the evening of October 1st, the two of them went to their friend Troy's apartment to help patch up some holes in the wall because he was moving to Minnesota with his girlfriend Lynette. Ben said he left without Kevin that night because he assumed Troy was taking Kevin home. When Lynette was interviewed, she said that she last saw Kevin in the early morning hours of October 1st when the four of them went in her car to their apartment to fix the door but realized they didn't have the right paint color. She said she then drove Ben and Kevin back to Ben's house around 1 a.m. and she went home. The next night, Troy and Lynette went to Ben's house and stayed over but she never saw Kevin there. Many years after Kevin disappeared, multiple rumors were circulating about what happened to him. His family recalled that Kevin's friend, Lene, had said that the day she found the jeans with blood on them, she also saw poured concrete that did not look like it was done professionally. Detectives went to further investigate the concrete, but Ben denied having ever done any concrete work in the basement. The owners of the home before and after Ben also denied doing any concrete work. In 2011, detectives decided to dig in the basement of the patch that was 90 inches long and about 20 inches wide. They excavated a small area, but stopped when they came upon a pipe. Many people believed that they did not dig far enough to be sure a body was not there. Suspiciously, many missing flyer posters were often taken down by an unknown person. Several people have taken and passed lie detector tests in connection with this case. Sadly, Kevin's mother passed away in 2014, never knowing what happened to her son. Foul play is suspected in Kevin's disappearance, but he has never been found, and as of today, the case remains unsolved. Bruce Aaron Falconer was born July 16, 1959. He would join the Marines at the age of 16 with permission from his mother. In February of 1981, at the age of 21, he was promoted to sergeant. He was about to be transferred to Yuma, Arizona and would take a leave to his home in Bismarck, North Dakota. This is when he would go missing and has never been seen again. While home on leave, on the night of February 20th, Bruce went out with a grade school friend named Tim Jewell. They went to some bars, and after the bars closed, they drove Bruce's Chevrolet Blazer to an area south of Bismarck along the Missouri River. A few days later, the vehicle was found stuck in the mud and abandoned. However, there was no signs of Bruce or Tim at the scene, but there were cigarette butts and the remains of a campfire located nearby. Bruce's mother, Dorothy Falconer, was in California that weekend attending her daughter's wedding. When she returned home on either Sunday or Monday, her younger daughter told her Bruce had not come home since Friday night. Initially, there was speculation that Bruce had gone AWOL from the Marines, but his mother never believed this because he was very happy with his military career. Early on, his mother concluded he had probably died shortly after his disappearance because he would not have left behind his family or even his blazer or paychecks. In 1992, Tim's remains were found in the area by a hunter. The coroner determined that Tim's likely cause of death was exposure. However, Bruce's body has never been located. The Marines declared Bruce legally dead five years after he went missing, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Rochelle Marie Smith was born September 10, 2002 and nicknamed Peanut. 
She lived in Minot, North Dakota with her aunt Stephanie Smith, who was also her legal guardian. A man named Lee Cohen also lived in the basement of the home. On May 16, 2006, Lee came home around midnight after celebrating his birthday with a night of drinking. Rochelle was asleep on one couch while Lee was watching TV on another. Stephanie went to bed around 1 a.m., leaving the three-year-old asleep on the couch and Lee still watching TV. Lee had been very close to Rochelle since she was an infant and claimed to be her father, although he wasn't related to her. At some point in the early morning, a neighbor heard Rochelle crying. Hours later, the same neighbor saw Lee pull into the apartment complex with Stephanie's van. The neighbor stated that he was acting strange and that he removed a red cooler and other items from the back of the van. Around 10.30 that morning, Stephanie woke up to find Rochelle gone and Lee already awake and dressed, which was very unusual for him. Lee told Stephanie that Rochelle was staying with his mother for a few days at her home at the Minot Air Force Base. During that same time, a different neighbor saw Lee going out to a waste bin with a bag of garbage, again acting very strange and standoffish. Six days later, on May 22nd, Stephanie woke up to find that Lee had taken her van. He left a note saying he was going to pick up cigarettes, but he never returned. Stephanie reported Rochelle missing and an Amber Alert was issued and Lee became the prime suspect in her disappearance. Stephanie went to Lee's mother's home and found out that she had actually moved to Wichita, Kansas the week prior. Police visited her home in Kansas, but there was no sign of Rochelle and she said she had not seen her. On May 23rd, the stolen van was located on a gravel road in the Upper Surris National Wildlife Refuge with Lee's body inside. He had died by poisoning himself with carbon monoxide. A hose from his basement apartment had been cut and used to pipe exhaust into the van. An extensive search of the area turned up no signs of Rochelle, but police did find a large red cooler in the basement where Lee lived. Inside the cooler was ammonia and rags apparently used to clean the cooler. They also found a substantial amount of Rochelle's blood. Police dogs tracked Rochelle's scent to the river channel across the street from the apartment, but authorities found no other clues. Searches were done of the parks along with horseback searches of wildlife and rural areas. A portion of the Surris River near the Smith residence was also drained, but nothing was ever found. Police determined the only explanation for Rochelle's disappearance was that Lee Cohen killed her early May 17, 2006 and disposed of her body in an unknown location. In May 2021, 15 years after Rochelle's disappearance, authorities stated that there was compelling and overwhelming evidence that Lee had murdered Rochelle and that there is no other plausible explanation for her disappearance. Her case was officially closed, but her body has never been recovered and as of today, this case remains unsolved.